If you've just downloaded QGIS for the first time, you might be thinking, what now? And that's who this video is aimed at. I have QGIS open on my computer. This is a Windows computer, but it works equally well on Linux and Mac. So you open QGIS and you see a blank screen like this. You usually see a layers panel on the left where you'll see map layers when you add them and a browser panel. But if for any reason you don't see them, you can go to the view menu and then turn the panels back on. So I'm going to turn on layers and I'll also turn back on the browser panel. You can access files from the browser panel and other stuff too, but for now we will just get some data. So one of the most important things is understanding where to get data and how to get it into QGIS. So in this little example, I'll pull in a web browser and I'm going to type in Geofabric with a K. And Geofabric are a company who archive very regularly open street map data for across the world. So you can get data for any part of the world. In this case, we're going to look at Washington DC. So you go to Geofabric home and they have a download section. And then in that download section, you want to click the link that says our download server at download.geofabric.de. So they're based in Germany. And one of the great things here is you can choose data for any part of the world, wherever you are, you can get data for. In this case, just to make it simpler, I'm going to go to North America and then you'll see sub regions within these areas. And then I'll go to the United States of America. And then we can see it's broken down by state and District of Columbia. In this case, I'm going to get data for DC. You'll notice when you get to this section, you can download this data that says .pbf, which is like a native open street map format. But I think it's usually easier to grab the shapefile data. Shapefile is obviously just a GIS data format. And I'll get a zipped folder with all the data that they've archived from OpenStreetMap for the District of Columbia. So I'll click on that link and I'll download it to my computer. And once it's there, I'll show you the folder with the data in it. Okay, I just downloaded that data and it's a zipped shape file. So I'm on Windows, so I'll need to unzip that. Uh, if you're on a Mac, that's not the same, but I'll go and unzip it. I'll extract it to here. There we go. And if I look inside the folder, if you're not used to GIS file formats, it can be a bit confusing. The first thing that's confusing is the shapefile format has at least three, but usually four parts for each shapefile. So even though it's called a shapefile, it's actually multiple files. And you can see that if you look here, for example, the ones called GIS OSM Buildings A3. There's actually, in this case, how many parts are there? There's actually five parts to this. Just so you know, the essential parts in this case are the SHX, the SHP, and the DBF. The PRJ has the projection. But you don't need to worry about that because QGIS knows this. So now what we're going to do is we'll move the web browser out of the way and we want to get this data, all these map layers, into QGIS. But if you're not used to doing this, it could be a bit confusing. So there's multiple ways you can do it. I could just drag and drop this data in and it will then appear in the map canvas in QGIS. So for example, if I highlight all these files and left click and drag and drop them in, it says there's 91 files, but actually it's only going to add one layer for each of the shape files. You'll see what I mean in a second. So when I do this, I'll see this thing's an invalid data source because I, I, I just dumped all the files in as if they were all mappable, but some of them like the PRJ, it's just a text file. So you don't need to worry about that. I can click on that and close all. That gets the data in, but as you can see, you get all these warning messages. It's a bit of a pain. So I'll remove them all. I will just highlight all these on the left. I'm going to remove them now. So that was me just dumping everything in. It's a bit of a messy way to do that. If I click this button, open data source manager, 
then I can go to the vector section because this data is vector data and then from here I can click on the browse button and I'm going to now browse to that folder where I downloaded the data to. Okay, I've browsed to that folder and I see all the files. And remember what I said, the shapefile is multiple files. So a shapefile is actually a group of files. So at the bottom, if I just change that from all files to Esri shapefiles, then we see just the SHP bit, which is fine. And I can select all these and click open and then add. And when you do that, and then I can click close on that, we will see all the files listed on the left and we don't get those warnings this time. So I showed you the first way because you can just dump them in, but sometimes you get those weird warnings popping up. And that's really to do with the fact that a shapefile is kind of a messy file format because it's got multiple parts for each layer. But you see when I added them that way, it's a little bit cleaner and quicker. So what we have is we have all the layers on the left. And if I click the I button, I can hide all layers. So that little I button, because all the layers are ticked, they're visible. If I click the I button and hide all layers, I can hide them all. And then I can turn ones on individually. So that's waterways. We've got water, transport, more transport, traffic. So let's turn on buildings. Okay. Land use, natural, and so on. So the next thing we might want to do when well, we've done something like this, we want to zoom in. So I'll click on the little zoom in magnifying glass and I'll zoom in to more central part of DC. And then let's just say we want to change these buildings to be like a gray color. On the left hand side, I can double click and it's going to open up layer properties. It may not open up onto the symbology section, but if you click on the symbology section, you'll see each polygon is represented by a single symbol. And if you click where it says simple fill, you can then change the colors. There's various ways you can do it. You can click the actual color patch and then choose colors this way in different tabs. Or you can click the little drop down and choose some of the standard colors. Or if I click the drop down again and pick color, I could pick this gray off the screen if I want to. And then I can left click and drag and drop to the stroke color. So the fill color is the internal color of the polygon. The stroke color is the outline color. If I click apply, the buildings go gray. It's a little bit light. So let me click that fill color patch again. And if I change the V value by just dragging the slider along a bit, I'm going to make it darker. So maybe about that. Okay. And I'll left click and drag and drop the color to the stroke color. The reason I'm doing that is I want the outline color and the fill color to be the same. Okay, so we've got buildings. I think what I want to do is I want to make the stroke width a little bit less, just so it's a bit sharper, 0 0.1. Yeah, there we go, okay. So now if I zoom in, what we'll see is the building polygons, outline and fill color are the same. And that looks a bit better. Let's turn on something else. Let's turn on natural. And I've turned it on, I can't see anything, but maybe that's because it's not in the area I'm in. If I click on zoom to layer, actually, it doesn't seem to be anything in this layer, this natural layer, which is a bit weird. Okay, sometimes that happens. Let's look at land use instead. So land use, well, we might want to know what the heck this is. The buildings one straightforward because we know they're buildings, but if I click on land use, we might want to know what these polygons represent. So we could actually open the table, the attribute table. So each layer like this has got a table associated with it. So let's open the table and we can see this F class column is, it's from OpenStreetMap and it tells us what kind of category each land use falls into for each polygon. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna close this attribute table and I'll double click on the left on the land use layer and I'm going to go to symbology. At the moment it's a single symbol so everything's kind of orange but we're going to go to categorized and the value we want to categorize by is that F class column but when you choose that nothing happens until you click classify and then we can see all the different options. So we have allotment, cemetery, commercial, forest and so on. So if I just click OK 
we can see different colors. And then on the left, I can actually expand this now via the little black triangle to see the different categories. From there, you're probably going to want to do things like change the color. So if on Nature Reserve you want to change the color to green, I can just double click and it's going to bring up the color for that one. Um, same as before, I can click Simple Fill and let's just choose a ready-made preset green. And then we have the, the green. So we can actually turn on and off any of these individually. But if I wanted to turn them all off, I could just, I've selected allotments and then I can right click and choose hide all items. And that will hide all items in this, in this uh, layer. And then I can just turn on nature reserve. And I could do the same with park, for example. And let's make the parks, uh, let's make the parks also green. But what I'll do is I'll click that color patch again and just make it a little bit brighter. And I'll drag and drop that color from the fill color to the stroke color. I'll click OK. And um, it's not quite easy enough to differentiate the color. So I'll make it a little bit darker too. And I'll drag and drop that to the stroke color and click OK. There we go. So from here, you can experiment with the data. So if you download it from Geofabric, you'll get a number of layers. These are the layers you get. You can explore the data, you can you can style it, but that's a good way to get used to adding data to QGIS, navigating it and styling it. And you can do that for anywhere in the world. Beyond this, it's going to take you some time to get used to how things work, but you'll see that in the other videos of various things you can do. For now though, Hopefully that's enough to get you started if you've just downloaded the software.